Danny and Nicole made them drink her his their meat. They made her drink that. He dog poop off of the floor. They made her use a uh, a toothbrush of her being. Um, they made her brush her teeth with it afterwards. I think it's called um mace or pepper spray or something. And they sprayed it in her face and her face was burned and her eye was swollen shut and stuff. And they hit her in the face real hard and made her lips swell up really bad. I was so scared. I just, I've never seen anybody do that to someone before. On March 27th, 2011, the Brooks family was finally happy. Sherry, the matriarch of the family, had come up with a perfect plan to kill intellectually disabled Vera Jo Regal. Yeah, you heard it right. It wasn't a one-person job. The entire family had participated in the murder. Sherry's son and Vera's boyfriend, Zachary Brooks, hit Vera so much that every bone on her face was broken. Sherry's other son, Chucky, made Vera dog poo. Daniel Bixler, who was the son of Sherry's cousin, shoved the knife into her Daniel's girlfriend, Nicole, kept asking Sherry if she could kill Vera right there. But Sherry had a different plan. She wanted Vera to turn into, quote, hamburg. She was thrown on the tracks with stab wounds throughout her body. Nicole and Daniel left her there to go to a party. They heard the train approaching, but it suddenly stopped. They assumed it was an engine problem. But in fact, the train conductor had found a body. It didn't take long for the authorities to reach the doorstep of the Brooks house. Different psychological assessments of diversely accused persons all rolled into one case and one video. They were saying how, what they did and stuff, and then who, like- who, who, Who's they? Like Zach and Danny. They were talking about what they did and stuff, and that's when I really started freaking out. I started crying and stuff, and then, like, they're like, man, you say anything, we're gonna kill you for real. Like, I'm not playing and stuff. So, did you get the impression Zach was with them when they killed her? What? I, I believe he was, because there's no way, you know? How would he know all the stuff? Well, what did he say, though? He just said how they killed her and stuff, and how they tortured her and stuff like that, and I didn't believe it. Can you give me examples of what they told you? Like, they said that they s***ed her throat, and after they s***ed her throat, she was begging to come home to her daughter. Who told they, you? Who told you that? Zach and Danny. And when she was begging, they stabbed her and stuff, and they cut, they tortured her and stuff like that. And I just I just broke down because, like, I work, I you can ask my mom to go basketball, I, I work with handicapped kids. I can never imagine doing something like that. Zach said, Something about f***ing her throat. Danny said something about stabbing her in her heart. And Nicole was like, we cut her from like right here to like right here and stuff. And yeah, Nicole said something about sticking a knife up her Something like that. And guards said they, they tortured her. Did you ask any other questions or anything? No, because I was scared. Okay. This is Alan Cap. He finds himself in the hot seat, delivering responses with the rapidity of a ticking time bomb. What drives this urgency? It can be assumed that fearing implication, Alan perceives quick answers as a lifeline to distance himself from the crime. Alan held the secrets of Vera's life and death close to his chest, yet chose silence when the moment demanded truth. Just the... The reason I got why they killed her is because this is this is the story I got from Zach. Like I'm gonna be straight up. Just Zach, Zach told me that Vera, because you know how she's not all there, right? Mm -hmm. She took um, pepper spray and she sprayed it all over the house because she thought it was cologne, and it got like it was everywhere. Like this is this is when he called. Like he called me and told me what Vera did, like, this is before, like, anything happened. This was on Friday, like, when he called me. He's like, man, Vera sprayed pepper spray and stuff, and she got up er everywhere, it was in my mama's lungs and stuff like that, and he said that... She thought it was what? Thought it was clump. Okay. And he said that, you know Shannon? 
I guess she was supposed to be pregnant. I don't know if she was, but that's okay. just the story I got. Okay. And supposedly, the pepper spray made her have a miscarriage. And that's why they did it. Okay, so what brings you up here today? Well, I had gotten some information that, um, that I was getting arrested. Okay. Because I guess um, the interview I did on TV, Channel 11 News, and I'm getting told by a lot of different people that I'm the one that's going to end up going to jail for it. And I mean, I came up here, you know, to tell everybody because I'm getting harassed on Facebook. And I'm getting called, you know, a killer. I'm getting told that I had a part in it. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know what they were going to do when they left the house with her. And as I told everybody else, I wanted to stop them. But Danny put a knife to me and told me if I did anything that he was going to kill me. I didn't believe him at the time because I didn't think he would do it. And, you know... And when they got back and they told me everything they did, I wanted to call the cops. I wanted to get the phone and call so bad. But Danny told me if I picked up that phone that he would do the same thing to me. And I was just so scared. And I told you about the belt part, right? You mentioned the belt. Yes. And they had a, it was a, it was a piece to a bike. Like it goes on the bike neck where the handlebars are. Okay. Um, and it had bolts on it. And they put that around the belt and they slammed it and they hit her in the back with it. Mm -hmm. And they just, they continuously kept hitting her like that. And Danny was stomping on her head and um, I got scared. And then I sat on the bed next to Sherry and I couldn't breathe. I was getting really scared. I was like, I was having a panic attack or something and I was shaking real bad. Shannon expresses distress over being labeled a killer and facing online hostility. By portraying herself as a victim of social media backlash, Shannon might be attempting to garner sympathy or elicit a more lenient response from the interrogators. But as you guessed it, she did not care for Vera, who was being tortured in the same house where Shannon lived. And then they, um, Danny and Nicole made them drink her, hit their, they made her drink that and um, dog poop off of the floor. And um, they made her use a uh, a, um, a toothbrush up her, and um, they made her brush her teeth with it afterwards. Okay. Um, just <laughs> everything. I mean, trying to think. Uh, they made her drink um, dish soap. I think it was or laundry soap or. I wasn't in the kitchen or anything. They had, uh, I think it's called um, mace or pepper spray or something. Mm -hmm. And they sprayed it in her face. And her face was burned and her eye was swollen shut and stuff. And they hit her in the face real hard and made her lips swell up really bad. I was so scared. I just, I've never seen anybody do that to someone before. And I didn't know what to do. I. I mean, I sat on the couch, you know, thinking somebody else would, you know, pick up the phone and, you know, call the cops or something. And I just think that everybody in the house was scared because no one's ever seen Danny like that before. And I mean, that was the first time I ever met him. I didn't know him before then. And I mean, he had just gotten out of prison and no one would tell me why. And, you know, I, you know, it's just, I got really scared and stuff. And my husband, you know, when he found out that Danny had held a knife to my um, my left side of my neck, my husband, you know, he was trying to protect me and stuff. So, you know, he like, he got in between me and Danny and told Danny, you know, to stop because he was going to end up hurting someone really bad. And I just, I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm just like really scared. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really worried. I can't sleep at night now because I'm just worried that, you know, something's going to happen. 
Shannon has entered the room with a purpose. She's not waiting for investigators to question her. She's here to reveal and list down everything. Her parrot speech goes beyond mere recounting. This pattern may indicate a compulsive and urgent need to steer and dominate the narrative. Yet Shannon's focus extends beyond the events themselves. Her emphasis on her emotional distress aligns with a victim mentality. She seems to be attempting to deflect attention from any potential role she played. Following Shannon's narrative, we have heard one name come up rather frequently, Nicole. What does she have to say about this? You said they acted like they were getting along okay? They acted like everything was fine, but knowing Vera, she, she never really acts like anything wrong. She just yeah. go along with anything anybody tells her, you know. She's probably the sweetest girl I've ever met, to okay. be honest. Okay. Can you tell me why Danny be hitting her or pushing her? Danny hit her? Yeah. I have no idea about that. Okay. Did you see that? No. I have okay. no idea about any of that. Again, you talk, talk about being truthful, yeah. okay? I have no idea about any of that. Okay. You never seen Danny lay a hand on her? No. Because she was looking at him? No. Okay. Did you ever get mad with her because he was looking? I mean, I get mad with her, but I just walk away because I know my temper. Okay. I just kind of say, Vera, just please stop looking at me. I was like, she's. He's not with you. Okay. He's with me. Why would that make you mad? If she's just, you think he's, she's trying to come on to him or what? Because she told Sherry that she wanted to f him. Okay. Her exact words, I want to f him. And then she said she wanted to be with me. So it kind of makes me mad, you know, but I just. Did she want to be with you yeah. too? Okay. Because I guess she's buying. Or she, okay. Ugh. But. I just kind of walk away from it because I know my temper and I'm trying to... I mean, did you ever lay hands on her? Mm -hmm. I can't get somebody. Okay. And did you ever see Danny lay hands on her? I've never seen him lay hands on her. Did it get heated? Did she say anything back to you? What did she do? How'd she react? She just kind of said, okay, 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 okay. I really don't know. I'm explaining what goes on and I just started living there like a week ago. Right. So. You were talking earlier about your temper and you know how your temper mm -hmm. went. Tell, tell me about your temper. What's that all about? Normally, I would go and punch walls. Like, before I even started hanging out with Danny and started dating Danny again, my friend made me really mad. Mm -hmm. So I went outside and I punched a fence, some four by fours, and then I went back inside and punched a texture block. Oh, you know when assessing a person based solely on video evidence, speculation can only take us so far. Nonetheless, we can definitely and surely say that Nicole embodies the traits of a master manipulator. Her attempt to paint Vera in a positive light, even as she knows she herself killed Vera, suggests she's a monster. If we put it more formally, it highlights an intense lack of empathy and remorse. Thirdly, her ability to lie convincingly and manipulate others can easily be related to sociopathic traits. Lastly, Nicole's apparent ease in constructing a deceptive narrative reveals a capacity for calculated dishonesty. That's my business card. What's that? We're going to get a uh, female officer in here. Yep. You're in custody. You're essentially under arrest at this point. That's my business card. Um, I would advise you, if, if for some reason this takes a bad turn and there's something you didn't tell us, you may want to tell us before we find out. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to not so good. And, you know what I mean? Like he said earlier, it's best to get it all out before that when we start looking into this, we find out what happened. Okay? So like he said, when you get with your mom, if there's more that we need to know, please contact us. And that way we can talk to you a little further. Okay? Any questions? Like he said, you're under arrest, you're not free to leave, so just hang tight. We'll try to find that female officer and we'll get you taken care of, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. And also, when you're talking to your mom, you might let her know that you talk to detectives and that we don't usually work on Sundays. Okay? That's how serious this is, okay? Thank you.
Now, as Nicole's lies unravel before the discerning eyes of the detectives, it begs the question, what is the full truth? For that, we turn to Shannon once again. Vera, she got up to go to the bathroom and I, I looked over and I seen Nicole follow her into the bathroom and I was sitting on the couch watching the baby, you know, so she wouldn't like go in and step on mom's feet or anything. So I was sitting in the living room watching her play and stuff. And I heard Nicole in there yelling at Vera in the bathroom. And Vera was, she was like crying or saying something. And then Nicole comes back out and she's laughing and smiling and she's got her hand like this on her face. And then I asked her what happened and she says, you don't want to know. And I said, okay. And then Vera comes out and she's, her hair is all wet and she's covering her face like this, like her eyes are hurting her. And when Nicole was, you know, out of the room, I asked Vera what happened. And Vera said that they put her head in, that Nicole had put her head in the toilet and made her drink the water. And then that's also when they made her use the toothbrush up her and brush her teeth with it. So she was kind of gagging and stuff when she came out and she got a drink. And then Danny had, it was either, I think it was Danny took the ketchup and poured it on her head. And um, I went in the kitchen, I said, okay, that's enough. You guys need to stop now. And I told Vera to go back in Sherry's room after she had gotten the ketchup out of her hair. And she, I told her, you know, just go in there and sit down, you know, just don't do anything, you know, just don't make them mad. And then Danny looked at me and said, why are you protecting her? And I said, because you guys are going far enough, you know, you guys need to stop this, you're really hurting her. So she went back in there and sat down. And I came back downstairs and I heard like a, a noise or like something coming from Sherry's room. And Sherry looks over at me and says, you need to come in here. And I said, okay. Then that's when they were hitting her with the belt with the little bike part on it. And I went up to Danny and I grabbed it or I like, I didn't grab him because I was afraid to. I went up and I like tapped him on the shoulder and I said, you need to stop right now. And they lifted up her shirt and her back was just, her back was black. I mean, it was black and blue and purple and yellow. And it was just, it was horrible and red. And I just, and she kept holding her head like this and she had her head down. And I thought, you know, her head was bleeding or something. And so then that's when Danny put the knife to my neck and told me, you know, you mean, he told me if I didn't hit her that he was gonna kill me. So I took the thing off and I I hit her I hit her once and it was only like not even hard, it was like kind of soft. I was I was really scared. So then he kept going closer and he's like, do it again and I was like, No, and I threw the belt and then Nicole grabbed it. And then I ran out of the room because my husband had gotten back after they had went to get trash bags. And then I had went to him and one of the boys, I think it was uh, Chucky, the youngest one, had told Michael what Danny did. And then Michael had gotten mad and I told him just to calm down and sit down. So I sat down on the couch with him and then finally, you know, they left her alone for a while. I was sitting on the couch because I, someone had sprayed something upstairs and I was coming down and I ended up going to the hospital because of it. And then after I got home, Danny and Nicole were upstairs when I got home on the bed they were sleeping on. And all I said to them when I walked up was, I lost my baby. And Danny looks at me with like this stern look on his face. 
And he said, that's it. I'm going to kill her. And I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think that he would actually do it. And I, I, sorry, I laughed. And I was like, yeah, all right. And I walked in my room. I laid down for a little bit. After absorbing the harrowing details, you might be shocked, wondering why such cruelty was inflicted upon Vera, and perhaps more baffled by the silence that followed. Let's find the answer to this question as the interrogation progresses. We may never know that answer for sure, but we could find some traces of it using the controversial art performance piece known as Rhythm Zero, conducted by Yugoslav artist Marina Abramovic in 1974. It was a social experiment and a provocative exploration of human behavior and the boundaries of free will. Abramovich arranged 72 objects on a table, ranging from feathers and honey to a loaded gun with a single bullet. She encouraged the audience to interact with her using these items in any manner they chose. Initially gentle, the interactions became dark as participants began inflicting harm on Abramovich, cutting her clothes, inserting thorns into her stomach, and even pointing the loaded gun at her. Rhythm Zero revealed the potential for abuse of power when individuals are given unchecked authority. Now, whether this means we all harbor a dark side is up for debate, but cases like that of Vera Jo compel us to acknowledge the unsettling possibility that the capacity for darkness lurks within all humans. In this case, everyone connected, be it Brooks' family, Sherry's son, their partners, ex-partners, friends, or relatives, either directly participated in violence or chose silence. Maybe, definitely, the capacity for evilness isn't exclusive. Well, I went back downstairs and Vera was getting her shoes on. This was around 9, 9.30. Yeah, around 9.30. <clears throat> and I walked down and I asked Vera, I was like, where are you going? And she said, well, Danny and Nakuna made me to go with them somewhere. I was like, okay. And I had asked her again, I was like, where are you guys going? He's, and she told me, well, I'm going to meet up with my boyfriend. I don't want to walk alone. I said, oh, okay, which her boyfriend at the time was Larry Spence. So we figured, okay, she's going to meet up with Larry, and then you know, she'll probably go with him for a little bit. So they left. Then about a half hour later, they came back around 10 10.05 or 10.15. And then Nicole walks in and she I, she looked at me and she was shaking and she was like, she's gone. She's gone. She kept, she kept saying she's gone. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I was scared. I was like, oh my God, please tell me you didn't do anything. And she's like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I was like, and I just, I stopped. Like I, I couldn't talk or anything. I was like, oh my God. And then Danny and Zachary and Garth had left and they went over to Danny's sister's Desta's house and to get drunk, I guess. I'm not sure about that story. They came home, or it was like 12, 31 o'clock, they came home and they came barging in our room and, you know, they're all three drunk and stuff. And I asked Danny, I was like, why'd you do it? And he's like, because I wanted to. And I was like, well, that's not a good enough reason. You know, you shouldn't have did that. That was wrong. I mean, she didn't deserve that. And all he looked, all he did was look at me, smile, and say, yes, she did. Nicole, she didn't say anything, so I was guessing she passed out. They had her throat all the way around, or, yeah, all the way around. And that they had stabbed her under her left and um and that they had stabbed her in the heart and they had um took the knife and they put it up her um behind and they had twisted and that they stuck it up her and they also did the same thing. And who who was actually saying that though? Which one of them Nicole was telling said, that? Nicole told me that. They wanted to make sure that she wasn't alive. So they put her on the railroad tracks and they laid her across them to make sure that a train had hit her. 
Within Brooke's family, there seems to be a pervasive presence of groupthink and conformity where each member of the family, from the eldest to the youngest, seemingly fell in line, participating in various forms of abuse directed at Vera. But why? Everyone in that family was wanting to fit in and find acceptance. And then there's the fear factor. The fear of standing out and being the odd one. It was cranked up to the max. The whole sense of belonging depended on just going with the flow, even if it meant doing things they had never dreamt of. In such situations, there's often a puppet master pulling the strings. And in this family, it was the matriarch of the family, Sherry. Now, here's a thought grenade for you. How much of this behavior is conscious? Or were these people just following an unspoken script written by Sherry? Yeah, I said that Vera was looking at Danny. Oh, you know handicapped, slower people. They tend to stare anyway. And she said, what do you want, my boyfriend now? She said, boom. <laughs> Started hitting her, slapping her, punching her, and then took her f***ing head and ramming it into my dresser. And it's like, oh, my God. Took her head and, then, and rammed it in your dresser. Yeah, and then she kept telling uh, Shannon. She said, why don't you stick up for your man? She said, uh... She's been looking at Michael, too. Shannon kept hitting on her and stuff. And then um, Nicole said, give me the belt again. I want to do it. Oh, I agree on that color. She's driving. Then she kept hitting her in her head and was like, oh, my God. Sherry had assaulted her own kids and was specially obsessed with baby girls. Yet most of her children came back to live with her as they grew up and flourished in violence just like her. She wasn't raising a family, she was instead building a cult. So how did Sherry blur these lines? The answer is rather disturbing. She made this possible by abusing each and every one of them. You might have heard of Stockholm Syndrome, which is a psychological phenomenon where victims develop feelings of attachment and empathy towards their abusers. To answer why is rather difficult, but it can be due to a combination of fear, isolation, and perceived acts of kindness. They had her by her hair and they were just hitting her head on the floor and kicking her and punching her. And they had grabbed something from outside and they were hitting her with that. I, I, it looked like a, like a crescent wrench or something. Mm -hmm. They were hitting her in the back with that and the side and stuff. And, Danny would stomp, I mean, he would jump on her head, like he would jump up in the air and then down on her head, and mm -hmm. he would kick her, and I just, I was so disgusted by it, but every time I tried to, you know, stand up and do something, Danny would push me out of the way and tell me no, and I mean, it's just, I wanted to stop him, and I mean, I, it's just, it's, it won't get out of my head, it won't leave, and I just, I, it's, yeah. This information um, that you've said today, you didn't tell it to me on Sunday when we talked. Right. When we talked on Sunday, I was scared and I, I couldn't remember everything. I was having a blank in my head and I think it was because I was nervous and I was scared. So you're telling me that Danny threatened to kill her, and then Danny and Nicole leave with her, and it doesn't register to you what's going to happen. Yeah. After they beat her repeatedly all day long. I, it didn't click in my head until they left. And so you decided to come in here on Sunday and, and not be forthcoming with the information that you had. I kind of remember everything at the time. I was... Not Shannon, let's, let's just stop that, okay? I don't believe you, okay? I, I would believe more that you were scared than I would believe that you don't remember. Because your memory right now is pretty damn good, three days later. When we're, when we're sitting in the room and I'm telling you, we're here, we're, you know, Vera's missing, we want to make sure she's okay, and nothing's happened with her, and you got all this information, I mean, you can't tell me that you didn't remember that on Sunday. And for you to come in here to lie, 
It's only going to make it worse on you and everybody else involved. Okay? Um, I mean, obviously, you know beer is dead. Beer was murdered. Okay? And whether you want to accept it or not, you're a part of it. Were you holding the blade? Did you do what was done to her? Certainly not. Okay? But you have kept information from us during the course of this investigation. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's 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 try and fix this as best we can, okay? And we need you to be honest about everything that happened, everything, okay? With Vera, not just Nicole and not just Dan, okay? And this is coming from multiple sources. It's coming from all over the place, okay? We know Zach's involved. We don't know exactly what, how you're involved. Um, we know about you hitting her with the belt. That part's true. I'm having some issues with your version of the story. Okay. okay. Um, and in the big scheme of things, in the big picture, it's way down here. Her death is way up here. Okay. So you need to think about how honest you want to be with us, okay? And if you need to go home and, and, and relax and, and maybe come back tomorrow, um, we're trying to be as honest with you as we can, okay? You're in trouble, right. okay? Right. You are in trouble. You lied in the course of a murder investigation. You just straight out lied. There's no other way to describe it. You completely lied. There seems to be several loopholes in the story so far, but what's the most disturbing aspect about this case isn't the torture, it is the selfishness of the people involved in the case. As the detectives question and confront Shannon about her initial dishonesty, we get the same excuse as made by everyone else. They were threatened to be quiet. Sure, the family was twisted and capable of killing, but does that discount these people of their responsibilities? And do you think Shannon would have played no part in the story? Well, there's a twist in the waiting. I do not, I do not want a lawyer. I want a lawyer. You do want a lawyer? Okay. No. okay. We'll stop at this point. I'm going to tell you right now, you need to get a lawyer. Okay. Because what's happening is, if you don't already know, we've talked to everybody, we've got written statements. There's a lot more than just Daniel and Nicole going down for this, okay? I'm going to tell you that up front, all right? Your mom may be one of them as well, all right? I think you know what we're talking about. Yeah. I think everybody, don't say anything because you said you wanted a lawyer. So I would highly advise you, as soon as you get back over to that jail, you better contact a lawyer because, as they say, everybody's jumping on the bus and you don't want to be the last one on the bus. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying by that? Yep. So it's going to benefit you greatly for one of these gentlemen to call up Judge Routes and, and say they believe you were honest and truthful. Okay? okay? And that's the best shot I can give you. I think we went back home and seen Danny and Nicole at the house and then found out they were beating on her. Okay, did, did you said earlier that you saw that. Was that, was that when you saw them beating on her? Yeah. Okay, who was doing, who, what was exactly did you see? Nicole and Danny beating on my baby's mom. Okay, explain that to me. When you say, when I... S they were hitting on her, kicking her. With their fists? Yeah. Both of them? Yeah. Okay, and this was inside your house? Yeah. Where did this take place inside In your house? In the living room. Okay, Who, was there anybody else around when that was happening? No. My mom was, but she was in bed. Okay. Anybody else hitting her? No. Well, specifically? Shannon was. Okay. Did you get a couple hits into? No, I never hit her. You never hit her? No. I don't believe in hitting females. Okay. So they were hitting and kicking her? Yeah. How, how many times do you think, roughly? Uh. Let me stay around that same time. You didn't see any sp any spray, any mace, nothing like we that? We never had mace or anything. Okay. So no, you don't know anything about a spray? No. Nope. Right. So Shannon comes back from the hospital, and that's when her and Beer get into it? Yep. That's yep. it. She said that you, she said you killed my baby and everything that was inside me. Okay. And she started laying off and hitting her. Okay. How was she hitting her? She hit her with a, 
Well, she started hitting her with her fist and everything, and then she wrapped, she got a belt over the padlock and started hitting her in the back with it. Shannon did? Yeah. Was anybody, I mean, you were there? Who else was there when that was going on? Me, Michael, Shannon, Garth, Chucky, Alan Cap, Danny. So every, Alan was still there when that yeah. happened? Everybody was, except for my dad, because he was grocery shopping. So everybody saw all that? Was Shannon hitting on beer? Except for my mom. Except for your mom? Because she takes the meds and go to sleep. Okay. Even after getting a legal counsel to represent him, the truth, it seemed, was his best defense. With so much already known about the case, any attempt to deviate from the established narrative would only serve to further incriminate him. The family-wide tendency to place blame on each other suggests a phenomenon known as group polarization. It's hard to say if the Brooks family was an echo chamber, magnifying individual twisted fantasies, or a spontaneous combustion of conflicting personalities. But what we can say for sure is that the blame game was coupled with power struggles and manipulation within the family. And who all knew that you had a miscarriage? Everybody in the house. I, when I came home, I, I went straight upstairs and then I came downstairs after Danny had told me that's it, she's she's dead. And I walked downstairs and then I told Sherry and I told the rest of them and I didn't think anything would really happen, I guess. I just wanted to seem like that kind of person. I mean, to my to my point, you know, he didn't seem like that kind of guy to me. Even though you'd seen him beating her? Yeah. You didn't seem like that kind of guy? It, it was just, it was, I was really confused and I was like, I, I've been, and it's been like really hard for me because I seen my mom go through the same thing. She was beaten and abused and. How did the Zachary react when he found out that you lost the baby? Zachary, he gave me a hug and said that he was sorry and that he wishes that I didn't. And he was, just, he was calm I and mean, he wasn't like, you know, mad or crazy or anything. He was just upset. Kind of know why you want to talk to us, right? Huh? Kind of know why we want to talk? Yep. Can you kind of go back and tell us what happened that day? All I remember is the, uh, Danny and Nicole was beating on my baby's mama and they were making her eat, eat a uh, bunch of stuff, making her drink soap, their pills. And then uh, Shannon told Danny that she was pregnant, which she wasn't. And Shannon told uh, Danny to do what she did. Okay, so Shannon, Shannon told Danny to kill him. Okay. Is that something you heard? Yeah. Okay, do you remember exactly what was said? Shannon told uh, Danny and Nicole to kill my baby's mom. Okay. Cause she, she said that, uh, Shannon said that she was pregnant and Vera sprayed pepper mace, whatever that is. And we never had pepper mace or anything like that in the house. Oh, you did? No. Who spread it? <laughs> she said, Shannon said that Vera sprayed it and killed her baby that was inside her. And which she was not pregnant. And she said, Shannon told Danny and Nicole to kill her. And we had went upstairs and I walked in my room and I was talking to Michael and our door was shut. And I had mentioned something about, you know, there wasn't nothing there, that I wasn't pregnant. And Nicole lost it. She came in our room and she's like, you lost the baby. I was like, whoa, I never said I was pregnant, you know? I said, I'm not. There was nothing there. What you told me today is quite a bit different from what you told me the first time around, okay? Mm -hmm. First time around, you told me that, you know, you had done 
several self-pregnancy tests that showed you were pregnant and everything. That's, I did forget to mention that today, but yes, I did do them at home and they were positive, but then when I went to the ER and told them what they had said, and they had done um, a blood test, they had come back negative. Mm -hmm. So I, in fact, was not pregnant. So. <coughs> It's been like that for a very long time. The truth finally came to light. Shannon's claim of having a panic attack while others attacked Vera juxtaposed with her role as the initiator of false accusations and subsequent abuse. She'd gone out of her way to frame Vera just for the sake of it. Because everyone tortured her, why would Shannon hold back, right? But she clearly didn't expect that it would be Vera's last day. Shannon can be seen having a victim mentality right from the start, but the fact that she can see herself as a target of circumstances, even when she played an active role in causing harm, is just purely disturbing. Like we talked about being truthful and honest, okay? That's not matching up with a lot of the other witnesses, okay? So if you went with them, we need to know everything that happened. I don't right? know with them. I'm not saying when things happen, but I'm saying as far as drinking and all that. I didn't go with them. Okay. I went by myself to my cousin's house. Well, I didn't go by myself. I went with my brother Garth. Okay. And now? Yeah. And you guys didn't all go together, meaning Nicole and Dan? No. Because Garth, both Garth, Michael, Shannon, they all said that you went and helped. I mean, <clears throat> I never went to the hospital with them. And how long do you think Shannon hit on her with her fist and with the belt and the Just lock? About 20 minutes. Okay. Anybody try to help her? Well, I got I got in a fight with my cousin because... Who's your cousin? Danny. Okay. I got in a fight with him. But he said that if I said anything, he was going to kill me. Okay. So I got in a fight with him and told him to leave her alone. And then you, and you said, why Shannon was... It? Did Nicole and Danny jump in too? Is that what you're... You said earlier that Nicole and Danny were hitting. Yeah. And then, was that after Shannon or at the same time? No, oh, after Shannon did it, and then Nicole and Danny jumped in. And what all were they doing? They were still beating on her, making her drink piss. And where did the piss come from? That. You know, I mean, did they pee in? What they pee in? Or a cup. Okay. Do you know who did that? Both of them. Both of them peed in the same cup or different cups? Different or? cups. And they made her drink it. What else did they make her do? They made her eat dog sh cigarette butts. They made her drink soap. Okay. That's something everybody was participating in, though, right? No. Just Shannon and Danny and Nicole. Okay. In no time did you hit her or I never hit her. Point. I don't believe in females. You're giving me a big tell, bud. We talk about truth. Every time you specifically, you're closing your eyes. I'm telling okay. you truth. Not on everything. <clears throat> All right? I'm going to tell you that up front. You're closing your eyes when you answer. All right? And we talked about that at the beginning, to be truthful about all of this, okay? <clears throat> we know you were hitting her. I was not hitting her. You have? You did? No, I didn't. We know that. All right? But we got to get past that. I you know, know the truth. I never hit my baby's mom. Never once. Why would everybody say that? I and mean, these are people that aren't even in your family saying they've seen you hit her. I don't know. I never hit my baby's mom once. I swear. So I, I can really not remember anything. I mean, I don't... I don't. I mean, I just don't see any sense. I mean, I, I'm not saying he's lying. I, I, I don't know. It's not matching up with all the other statements about who went to the hospital. I mean, and like I told you out there, if the little stuff doesn't match up, there's nothing criminal about going to the hospital with your with your sister. I understand that. I explained um, that. To <laughs> um, we gotta get him back shortly too. I know. So. Yeah. He was talking about wanting to take a polygraph about what he was telling you. I explained to him it's not TV where they wire you up, ask you some questions, and let you go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the judge is going to go along with that. The prosecutor would want some type of, uh, um, if he passes, cool. If he 
doesn't pass when I use it against him in court, I would not ever stipulate to that stuff. Yeah. Right. I just can't do it. So anyway. If you want, we can give you a few more minutes with you. If you guys need to tidy anything up or... No, 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 no. I thought I, he was relating things to me in time frames. And uh, uh, you know, I'm a visual learner. I have to see pictures. I can't read and get it. Right. And uh, other people get it different ways. So I don't know. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say? Otherwise, we might as well wrap this up. No. Okay. Zachary is donning a mask of denial in an attempt to distance himself from the responsibility of stopping others from harming Vera. He has employed narrative framing crafting a story that positions him as a mere observer and nothing more. Detectives strategically pose pointed questions to reveal how Zachary navigates around accountability. They've chosen a strategy of direct confrontation and expressing disbelief to challenge Zachary's narrative. Both these things are useful to create psychological pressure on him. The intention is to prompt internal cognitive dissonance and encourage him to reconsider his stance. So far, we've heard everyone except Daniel, who holds a center stage in this crime. Tell us what happened. I mean, you basically told us what happened. If the cards fit right, you could be looking at a death panel. Do you understand that? Okay. You talk about this. You go see that kid if you get the death penalty? Not for long. Right? And I don't know what the policy is in some of those places if they do do the death penalty. You may not get a seat, kid, if you're on death penalty. I don't know what they do. And again, going back to what we talked about with the prosecutor, which ones they gotta look at? Are someone being truthful? Or someone telling them bits and bits and bits, okay? You keep taking little step by little step. All right, we just want the whole truth. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? And another comment you made to one of them was, I gotta get another teardrop. You don't say that stuff unless you did it. You wanna write out a statement? Not really. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't tomorrow. I know you're probably tired. You know, maybe get some sleep. Maybe if you want to talk to us again, you can. You feel free, okay? Tomorrow, whatever. Get you a business card. Uh, you want one last one before we head over? Yeah. All right, I'll get you another one and we'll get you, get you out there, okay? okay? You can get some shut eye, hopefully. Please, that uh, woman was telling What's that? I don't run to jail, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Maybe we can arrange that. I'll see if they just keep being buggy. Okay. All right. Daniel and Nicole got off to the abuse they were inflicting upon Vera. During these sick procedures, they got turned on and went upstairs to get intimate. The shift from aggression to intimacy could indicate a need for control and the gratification derived from exerting power over others. It's also linked to dominance and submission dynamics. With the ability to engage in abusive acts without emotional inhibition, lack of remorse, high impulsivity, and post-murder bragging, Daniel puts on quite the display of textbook psychopath. With the sadistic facade of the Brooks family laid bare, the narrative now turns towards the courtroom. After their arrest, Daniel helped the police locate the murder weapons, a butcher knife thrown in the Blanchard River. In May 2011, charges were filed against four family members for obstructing justice related to Vera Jo's murder. Zachary faced two counts, while Sherry, Michael, and Shannon faced one each. Despite the charges, they pleaded not guilty and were released on bonds. Later, 14-year-old Chuck faced obstruction charges too. In June, Daniel pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. In a turn of events, Zachary changed his plea to guilty, agreeing to testify against Daniel and Nicole. Michael also admitted guilt to obstructing justice. In August, Daniel changed his plea, confessing to serious charges, earning a life sentence without parole for 40 years. Nicole admitted guilt, pleading to conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping, and tampering with evidence. She received a 23-year prison sentence, the maximum allowed by law. For those who loved Vera Jo, the scars run deep. 
and the psychological wounds may never fully heal. From manipulators to psychopaths, sadists to liars, each member played a distinct role in perpetuating the cycle of abuse and deception. Beneath the surface of their twisted actions lies a deeper truth. A truth that speaks about the fragility of the human psyche and the insidious nature of abuse. Each member of the Brooks family, from the most outwardly charming to the most overtly malevolent, bears the scars of their upbringing, their choices influenced by a toxic environment of fear and control. Vera endured abuse from both her biological father and stepfather, while Sherry herself suffered abuse at the hands of her father. The cycle continued with Sherry and her children falling into the same pattern. The Brooks family was built on the foundation of abuse. So all this prompts a vital question. Did the members of the Brooks family have any choice to do something right? Given the context, we invite you to share your thoughts and insights on this case. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. If you would like us to cover any specific case, please drop your suggestions. Also, remember to like, comment, and subscribe to Real Crime Psychology so that we can keep covering such cases. Until next time, stay safe.